college football is a drug and we're all about ready to relapse, but it's a good drug. It's not one that's going to kill us. It's actually one that's going to bring us joy and excitement and euphoria on every Saturday in the fall. All we got to do is get through the summer, which feels like an eternity. Yeah, we have a Memorial Day, three-day weekend. Good for us. America's birthday. Have a glizzy on me, 1776. But soon, week one's going to arrive, and then we can have the fun conversations. Which SEC teams are viable threats to win the national championship? Is there a Missouri or Ole Miss 2.0 in 2024? Which team got way too overhyped in the offseason, didn't live up to expectations, and now might be making a coaching change. But before any of that happens, we have spring games this upcoming weekend. Eight total, if I'm not mistaken, in the SEC. And I figured, let's go ahead and break down the top storyline to follow for every single game that happens in the conference. That just means more. So what's going on, SEC Unfiltered? It's Cole Thompson here. Make sure you hit the like button and the subscribe button and the ring notification down below. That way you don't miss a single episode of SECU because we're talking college football every single day on this platform. Follow me on my own YouTube channel at Mr. Cole Thompson. Follow me on my own social media page at Mr. Cole Thompson. Download the podcast version of the show wherever you get your podcast listening systems. Google Play, Apple Music, Spotify. Got you covered 24-7, 365. Also, make sure you're following us on social media. We are everywhere and we're going to be everywhere forever. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, whatever else Elon Musk comes out with in the future at SEC Unfiltered, and to keep up with the number one content in the number one conference in all of college athletics, make sure that you visit secunfiltered.com. Top storylines to follow in the spring games. For starters, I'm going to throw this out there, and I might be alone on this take. I don't really care. I hate spring games. I absolutely hate everything about spring games. Not because of I don't enjoy the product on the field and seeing the fruits of the labor of what those 15 practices meant, but because of I feel like it's a tease. All it is is getting me hyped up that I am going to see this team take flight. And then I got to remember, well, I got four months until actually week one rolls around and the transfer portal is about ready to run rampant a second time. People do not understand how crazy it is about to get in the world of the NCAA portal persona. And a lot of players that you didn't think were going to transfer, they're going to transfer. And some of these schools may actually land a prospect that they never thought was even possible. But real fast, let's go ahead and break some of these games down. Alabama, Jalen Milrow, and Kalen DeBoer's offense. Kalen DeBoer, it's his grand debut. That's all we can say. He is absolutely going to be dressed to the nine. He's going to enjoy watching his team do everything on, on A-Day. Everyone's going to be involved. But I'm really focusing in on Jalen Milrow for one reason. He's wearing a black jersey. He's not running. We know what he is in the open field. That man can boot, scoot, and boogie like Brooks and Dunn into any end zone, and he can terrorize you in the open field to where literally turn on the Jets, and you're just kind of catching his dust like Speedy Gonzalez. So we know what he is as a runner. We knew what he was as a passer. The deep ball is there. What about the intermediate part of the field? And the one thing that's going to be really terrifying if you're not an Alabama fan is if he does hit. Imagine if, just like Michael Penix Jr., you're able to see the progression, especially across the intermediate part of the field when it comes to Jalen Milrow, with new wide receivers, because there's no more Jermaine Burton, there's no more Isaiah Bond, there is no more Amari Nyblack, so who's stepping up and taking over as the head honcho in T-Town? What am I looking for in terms of that second stage? Can he elevate his passing attack? We know he's basically related to Uncle Rico, but can he be every bit of the quarterback. If he can be a dynamic dual threat, full-fledged, intermediate, deep shot, short route passer, that's going to put everyone on notice. Alabama was never going to fall off the face of the earth as many people want to make it out to be. But if they're able to have this type of offense the same way that they had in Seattle, Tuscaloosa is going to be humming. And more importantly, it's going to be on fire because the offense is going to take flight. Tennessee, I look at defensive improvements. Everyone wants to focus in on Nico Iamaliava, and while they should, the kid has basically been hyped up to be the heir apparent of Peyton Manning since he was in high school, and he is the right fit for Josh Heupel's offense. Go, 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 no stop, 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 but I do know that he is probably going to be very limited in this game. I look at the weak point, and what has been the one weak point for Tennessee over the last few years? Explosive plays. The inability to rush the quarterback, the inability to stop a play 20 yards down the field, setting up for a red zone, and teams capitalize and they walk away with at least three points. How much more improved are they going into year four under Hypo? How much better do they feel with this offense being balanced, cohesive? I mean, defense being balanced, cohesive, and more importantly, 
who steps up for the players that left in the portal? You no longer have Tyler Barron. You no longer have Terry and McDonald. Who comes in and plays that essential role at safety, at cornerback? Who's opposite of your other pass rusher? How do you feel about your run defense? Because if that team is able to now have this offense that everyone sees as just being a high-tempo passing, they're really good at running the football. And Dylan Sampson's a phenomenal running back that I think is going to take over and really take flight. If they can be balanced, and maybe, you know, you give up 10 points on offense, so instead of averaging 42.5 per game, you're averaging 32.5 per game. But your defense is given up instead of 395 yards, 325 yards. Well, now you put yourself in the driver's seat for that tier two SEC contender for a college football playoff spot. You don't need to win the conference to go to the CFP. And the SEC of all schools out there, they know firsthand, without question, they're going to be able to land four or five, four or five programs in a dozen dance. Can Tennessee be one of those teams? Defensively, if they improve, I have no questions about them because offensively, I know what Josh Hypo is going to be cooking up. Speaking of offense, Bobby's back. I want you to go tell yourself that you found a time machine. The flux capacitor is working. You get in the DeLorean and you get to go back to 2010. And Bobby Petrino is the head coach at Arkansas. And you're sitting there and you're going, yeah, this is really cool. Bobby turning the program around. It's looking great. And then you tell your future self, yeah, he's going to have a crash and burn incident. He's going to go off the skids. He's going to actually fall over the handlebars. And then it's going to basically turn into a madhouse. And about a decade later, he's going to come back, not as your head coach, but as your offensive coordinator. And the crazy part is, is that I think at this point, that's all you're looking for. Stability on offense. And how crazy would it be that Bobby Petrino is the savior of Fayetteville a second time? Turns the program around. Leaves in a dismay, fiery, crash and burn. The jokes write themselves, people. Don't laugh at them. Please do not go ahead and fall for this bit. Comes back as the new OC. Loses the starting quarterback that was beloved by fans in Fayetteville. And they improve. Like, let's just say for one random reason, Arkansas is that team that goes from, you know, on the verge of firing their head coach. Kind of like West Virginia was last year with Neil Brown, too. Well, well, now he's got to be a consideration for coach of the year. And at that point, Bobby Petrino's got to be the front runner to go get the Broyles Award. If this offense headline by Talon Green, who's coming over from Boise State, is more dynamic, more cohesive, more balanced, oh, sweet Lord. I know that defense is going to be at least somewhat manageable, but if that offense is able to hit without Rocket Sanders and without KJ Jefferson with the newcomers in, that's just a testament that Bobby Petrino knows offense. And more importantly, not letting him go was the best thing for your team at the time but also probably the worst thing for your team at the time. Georgia, who's the number one receiver? Everyone wants to focus in on the NFL draft, and well, they should. Brock Bowers, is he the top five player? Will he go top 10? What about Ladd McConkey now finding his way into day one buzz? Well, the buzz around Athens is, is that they love their wide receiver room. You talk to people who cover the team. You talk to people who are on the beat. You know that Dylan Bell is going to be a Swiss Army knife. You know Oscar Delp's going to be your starting tight end, but who comes in at wide receiver? You brought over London Humphreys, the Nashville native who played at Vanderbilt. Now he gets to be your new ex. You also brought over Kobe, Colby Young from Miami. How does he fit into this offense? You still have Dominic Lovett, a Marius, uh, 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 Marius, uh, Marius Smith. He's garnering buzz right now. Probably the most buzz he's gotten in years on end. And we know this team is always going to be able to re replace running back talent and offensive line talent. It's basically Alabama circa 2010 2.0. But how does it look when you have a dynamic passing unit? You got to remember, this is a team that needs a number one receiver and really two complementary pieces. And if you're able to attack the middle of the field, if you're able to have those deep shots with a quarterback like Carson Beck, the number one quarterback in college football this year, I'm not really going to sit here and argue with you on that one. I feel very confident that Georgia not only is going to be the number one offense in the SEC, they're going to be the number one offense in college football. They're dynamic. They know how to run the football. They know how to throw it down your face. And more specifically, they know what they have and what they don't have. So if they're able to figure out, we have everything, what's stopping them? Honestly, what's stopping them? Because you can argue that it's a rigorous schedule. It is compared to years past. But this is Georgia we're talking about. This is a national championship caliber roster. This is a team that was a play away last year from potentially getting a three-peat against Michigan in downtown Houston, where I actually live. So never say never. Uh, if you're able to find at least one stable wide receiver, maybe two, you're in really good hands to not only take the next element, 
but maybe even have a Heisman Trophy quarterback in your disposal at the same time. Speaking of having great deals, a uh, great deal that we have right now, Growback. If you haven't heard of them, for starters, why? Why have you not heard of them? Because it's time to check them out, especially when you know what's at hand. They got the Masters this weekend. Who are you rooting for? What type of drinks are you enjoying? Are you having a pimento cheese sandwich? But are you specifically having an azalea? An Azalea Collection shirt brought to you by Roback. It's the best time of the year. The designs are too good. Trust me, I'll tell you right now, I feel good. I look great when I'm wearing my Azalea shirt in the spring. And I look phenomenal on the golf course. Not my backswing. It's absolutely awful. But I don't have back sweat. And you want to know why? Because Roback's performance polos are the most comfortable thing out there. Their moisture wickening and their four-way stretch makes them perfect for golf events, makes them perfect for game day, and it makes them the ideal fit for you going into the hot, sweltering sun. In all honesty, Roback has been gaining traction for big time. Alabama's Jalen Milrow is represented by them. We got to deal with them, and we got to deal for you. Go visit Roback, R-O-H-O-B-A-C-K.com, and use the promo code SCCU for 20% off on all bottoms, polos, hoodies, and much more with your first purchase by the end of the week. That's Roback.com, SECU promo code, 20% off your first order. You look good, you feel good, and more importantly, you're going to want to go ahead and dress yourself to the nine. You want to feel like how your team looks on Saturday. Make sure that you go ahead and do that with Roback.com. Speaking of which, let's talk about it. LSU, still scary offense. They lost everything. They lost everything this offseason, including some depth on the offensive line. No more Logan Diggs, no more Jaden Daniels, no more Brian Thomas, no more Malik Neighbors, who should have won the Belitnikoff Award. I'm not going to argue this with people in the Big Ten. I get it. You have Marvin Harrison. Cool story, bro. Neighbors was the better wide receiver. I'm sorry. I get a little defensive. I am a Belitnikoff Award finalist voter, so I did vote for Neighbors. But how does this neotic offense look now with Garrett Nussmeyer? And more importantly, how does Nussmeyer look now as the full-time QB1? We've seen him in spurts. Really good. He's got a deep ball. He is able to throw it a country mile. That kid has every bit of an arm strength that you were looking for at the next level. But how does this look and how does it translate over to now live reps? Because in practice, if you throw an interception, okay, you go back to the huddle. Things are going to go ahead and revamp themselves. What does it look like when you do throw an interception and now it's a turnover? And now the second team offense goes against that first team offense. Who steps up as the new number one wide receiver? Is it CJ Daniels coming on over from Liberty? Is it Kyron Lacey going from number three all the way up to head honcho? How do you feel about the offensive line? You got the number one tackle in the SEC in Will Campbell. That's 100% a done deal. But how do you feel about the depth of it? And how do you feel about protecting a guy like Nussmeyer who isn't as mobile or isn't as elusive as JD5, the Heisman slinging quarterback? If this team can look good. Oh, and by the way, one more thing. Um, new offense coordinator, Mike Denbrock's gone. He's now at Notre Dame. And that offense is going to be humming in South Bend. Can it still be humming in South Bend, Indiana? And if so, if it's humming in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, then I feel like that you are looking at a very good balance team. I am not ready to call anything on LSU. I think that they could be a college football contender. I think they could be a college football dark horse. They could go seven and five, but knowing Brian Kelly, death, taxes, 10 double digit victories every single year feels like an MO. You have a good stable offense. And if this defense looks good, because I don't really worry about Blake Baker, the man was able to turn Missouri into a top 25 unit last year. He can do the same thing with the talent that resides in Southeast Louisiana. If you do that, you feel really confident that you can take on the world. Brian Kelly's going into year three. This is the year where I expect LSU, if everything is clicking, to eventually find their way to a college football playoff and get a couple of wins. My main storyline here, what does this team look like now with a brand new quarterback? Florida, it's year three. Act like it. Just, just, just act like it. I'm not asking for anything. I'm, I'm really not asking for anything, Billy Napier. Florida fans are not asking for anything. They're, they're going to give you a pass for the summer and for the spring. They're going to just say, you know what? Bygones be bygones. Just act like you've been here before. Because the last thing you want to see is more regression with this team. This was one of the worst pass pros last offseason. 9.2 uh, pressure rate. I think it was like 121st in the country last year. Graham Mertz was, was better than advertised. He was a reason why you won multiple games. And you do have a very good up-and-coming wide receiver in Eugene Wilson. And you still have Montreal Johnson in your backfield. But to me, the main question that I do have here, the main one that I do have here, how good can this team be 
just on finalizing mental mistakes. So many times last year, go back and watch Florida. They shot themselves in the foot, especially in the second half. They didn't feel like they were conditioned properly. They felt like there were too many errors when it came to formations, when it came to lining up. Uh, they were terrible on special teams, awful on special teams. Like you can't have that and consider yourself a program on the come up. This is year three. And last year it acted like it was year one. And there was so much regression. Billy, I'm begging you. I root for you. I'm probably one of the biggest pro Billy Napier fans on the internet that talks college football. Figure it out, dude. Figure that just look like you're a team that can actually hold your own. Because if so, here's what's going to happen. No one's going to believe in you. No one's going to say that that college football schedule from hell is going to do anything. But they are going to say, you know what? They're going to be a threat in the fourth quarter. And as long as you're going into Tennessee and you're playing a close matchup, Tennessee may win that game. But you won the argument that there is improvement in Gainesville. Just act like you're an actual team that's going into year three. Two more for you, Kentucky football school. Mark Stoops got the last laugh. It's so funny. It's so funny that for years, all we heard about Kentucky at basketball school, Kentucky at basketball school, Mark Stoops, who wasn't good enough to ever be the Texas A&M head coach, or at least that's what the message boards on Texag said, comes out and makes a statement. We're a football school. Well, now you are, because I have no idea what's happening in Lexington. Those message boards last night, by the way, I got to take a sip. Ah, karma, right? Beautiful time. That is now the opportunity for you to strike. Mitch Barnhart made one great move, keeping Mark Stoops happy. Because if you have not had a coach like him since Bear Bryant was running the show back in the 1950s, that's the most winningest coach in college. I mean, that's the most winningest coach in Lexington history. You brought over a ton of talent. You brought over a smorgasbord of names in the SEC that are going to be staples, I think, by next season. Uh, Brock Vandergriff at quarterback. You also brought over Chip Trainum from Ohio State. Two receivers, Jamori Macklin from North Texas, the number one receiver in the Conference USA. Raymond Cottrell, I got to see him live for a year at Texas A&M. Baffling, just, just incredibly talented wide receiver with, with immense upside. Jamon Dumas Johnson defensively, that's your new thumper. That's like Jamin Davis 2.0. How good can this team mesh? And can you live up to the hype as a football school? Because the one thing that we also know about Kentucky, like every few years we see them go out, and they find a way to get to like 10 wins. It's like really close to potentially happening again this year. And this is a roster that I think can get to 10 wins. And you look at their schedule, it's pretty manageable. You could see eight and four early November. Maybe, you know, you're eight and two and you're like, we win these two games. We're a dark horse. We may not make it to the college football playoff, but if we win these last two games and we beat Louisville. We're going to bring in some buzz. And you know what? At that point, you got to feel pretty confident about what everyone is saying when it comes to the Wildcats. One more for you, Ole Miss. New running back. A lot of people are going to be talking about the transfer portal because the portal king went to work, and he's so damn good at it that he landed premier talents like he does every single offseason. Lane Kiffin is basically a wizard when it comes to selling the likes of Ole Miss, and they're better for it. The thing is that I would focus in on the defensive line with Prince Uman Manley Ellen. I would focus in on Walter Nolan. Last season, the defensive line was part of the issue to why they lost to Georgia, why they lost to Alabama. But it's the Grove Bowl games, not the Grove Bowl. Like, it's basically Talladega 2.0 where people are going to be showing up in shorts and boots and they're going to have their koozies and they're going to have their giant cans. I mean, their giant coolers filled to the brim with natty lights and they're making a day of it like it is at the baseball field for Swayze. That's going to be the case. The running back room reminds me of the one area to where there's an Achilles heel. Every team has that Achilles heel going into the offseason. And to me, I don't know what I'm getting in Ulysses Bentley coming back from turf toe surgery. I have no idea when Logan Dix is playing. Blake Kibben has no idea when Logan Dix is playing. He could be out there week one. Could be out there week 13. Could be redshirted this year and we'll see him in 2025. And at that point, he may transfer. You may need to go get a running back. And if the running back room feels a little depleted with the depth behind what you have, you may have to splurge. And here's the best part. Lane Kibben has made it clear to everybody out there, yes, we are going to spend money with the Grove Collective. You might want to spend one on a guy like Damian Martinez out of Oregon State or maybe a Dallin Hayden out of Ohio State. How funny would it be if literally it was a trade-off of running backs and then you see similar results in Columbus for Quinn John Junkins and similar results for Dallin Hayden in Oxford, Mississippi, just Jersey switch. 
No wonder why. I just think that at this point, you have to look at the running back room. If there's a need, there's an element, you have the funds, you have the resources to go out and spend a little bit of cash. You want to be that team that is done playing second fiddle. This is a new era of Rebels football, and you're rocking and rolling all the way to the top of the pecking order. I think you got a top three coach in the SEC. I think you got a top seven coach in college football. Go embrace it. Take the big swing. So if running back feels like a weak point, Go out and spend. That'll be one thing that I'm monitoring this weekend. You know that Jackson Dart is going to be slinging it around the yard. You know you got two really good wide receivers. You know you got a returning tight end. You feel better about your defensive secondary overall. If your running back room is a little depleted, you got to do whatever you can to make sure that you don't have that Achilles heel going into the final week of the regular season. Those are my storylines to follow. Make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button down below and the ring notification. That way you don't miss a single episode of SECU. Comment. Tell me who do you think is, what do you think is the number one storyline for your team this upcoming weekend? Go ahead and follow me on social media and my own YouTube channel at Mr. Cole Thompson. Make sure you're following us on social media because we're everywhere and we're going to be everywhere moving forward. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever else, Elon or whoever else comes up with an app at SEC Unfiltered to keep up with the number one content surrounding our favorite sport every single day. Make sure you visit secunfiltered.com. I'm Cole Thompson. Until next time, folks. Later.